All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to the live stream. Uh, if this is your first time here, I'm Doug the Bee Guy, and this channel is all about helping you become an amazing beekeeper and learning from my mistakes. Um, if you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Um, it'll help you become a better beekeeper, and don't forget to uh, click the bell notification icon so that you get notified whenever I put new stuff up. We have a great uh, presentation tonight. I hope uh, you can watch the whole thing. It may be a little longer uh, than usual. If you can't watch it, you can always come back to it. I'll put it up right after it processes tonight. Uh, and there's also going to be some great resources that I put in the description besides the information that I cover. So you'll get a lot out of this one. Uh, how you doing, Eric? Welcome. Um, we've got a few people coming on right now. That's fantastic. So I am not going to uh, waste anyone's time because, like I said, we've got a lot of information to go to. And remember that you can share this with your friends or beekeepers or beekeeping groups or hit the like button as many times as you want. And that helps YouTube know that people are actually interested in this and they push it out a little bit more. So hopefully we'll get some more beekeepers and uh, more interaction. I've had quite a few people watch it after the fact. My very first one has already 4,000 views, so that's fantastic. Um, thank you guys for watching, and I hope that you're learning something from these. They do take quite a bit of time to set up, and I hope that people are learning something. So tonight we're going to talk about Varomite treatments, um, why, when, and how. I'm going to kind of go through each of those things and talk about the why, the when, and then I'm going to talk about uh, five different varroa mite treatments, just kind of show you what they are, talk about their effectiveness, and just to introduce them. Obviously, I can't go into depth on each one. Um, I will be doing some videos on some of the ones that I use. I don't use all of these, but I just want to introduce them to people and show you the different um, effectiveness of them and what they can do for you to help you. And that's kind of what we're going to do. So... Varomite treatments, why, when, and how. And if I forget to transition the slide, uh, please somebody uh, say something in the chat because I'm not used to this uh, software yet and I always keep talking and forget to transfer the slide and then people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> All right, so why do you care about mites and why do you want to treat? Um, well, save your bees from dying. That's the number one reason um, that I treat for varroa mites. Uh, I didn't when I first started uh, four or five years ago. I've been doing this 10 years ago. Uh, I've been doing this 10 years, but four or five years ago, I decided I wasn't going to treat anymore. And I was just going to like do my thing and see what happened and ignore the mites. And yeah, it didn't work real well. And I lost lots of bees and I ended up spending a lot of money on packages every year. And so... Um, the last few years, I've been treating uh, religiously, and the numbers are coming up, and I'm starting to increase in size again, and so I believe in treating. Um, if you don't believe in treating, that's your prerogative, and I'm not going to try to talk you into it. I'm just telling you what I do. Um, another reason is to keep the mites from migrating. Uh, there's a lot of information out there about... Uh, if your hive is crashing from mites and they're dying, the bees will actually understand that and they leave. A lot of them leave, especially the drones, and they leave before the hive dies and they give mites to other hives in your area or other, you know, bees and trees, or maybe you have other hives somewhere else and they'll go there and they'll spread the mites. So just because you're not treating doesn't mean you're not actually spreading the problem. And especially if you're by, you know, commercial beekeepers and things like that, they usually treat their bees. But sometimes they'll put, you know, a few hives here, a few hives there, and they forget about them. And uh, when those mites or when those hives crash, the mites will literally propagate uh, 
I had uh, that situation happen to me. There was a beekeeper that had 10 hives not too far from me one year, and my mite counts went way up because he put them there, and then he didn't come back and do anything with them. So that's not the norm because usually they're way better at doing it than we are, the commercial guys, but, you know, it just depends on the situation and where they're at, and maybe they can't get to them because of the weather or something like that. So keep them from migrating. They do move around, um, and that's important. Um, the other reason is to prevent viruses. So the other thing is that I talked about in my uh, top five things that kill your bees is that, you know, the viruses that the varroa mites uh, carry and transmit, <coughs> excuse me, are some of the big killers of bees also. So if you treat for mites and you knock them down to a, to a reasonable level, um, you're never going to get them to zero. You might get them close. But if you knock them down to a reasonable level, you know, the number of bees that will be infected with something will be very minimal and the hives can, uh, you know, absorb that loss and they'll be fine. And so the viruses is a big deal. And number four is, you know, improve your overwintering odds. You know, mites are the main thing that kills your bees over the winter, um, that and starvation. So if you can get rid of one of those two problems, and, uh, you know, once you figure out how much honey to leave for your bees over the winter, you'll be surprised at how quickly um, your success rate overwintering will, will rise. And you'll be surprised. And I know I was because I was thinking, I was, you know, a few years ago, I was thinking about I might not do this anymore. Even though I make a lot of money from the honey, I was just like, it's so much work. The bees are always dying. And, you know, once I started treating, things really turned around. So... I, I definitely would suggest at least trying it. Maybe try it with part of your hives and see see what a difference, you know. Let's say you have 10 hives, do five, and don't treat the other five. And you might be surprised at the, uh, you know, those five that you treated, they might survive, have a bigger, higher percentage of survival, as long as you don't have the migrating mites. See, that's the problem. So you'll never really know unless you uh, check. And that's... Uh, Another video I'll put up, but there's a lot of people putting videos up about, you know, checking for mites. So we're not just going to treat no matter what. We are going to check, but I don't want to put that in this video because there's other information out there. I'm going to do another video about testing to see if you have mites. We're assuming that you have mites and that you want to do something about it. And that's what this video is all about. We're not just going to blanket treat hives for no reason if there's uh, no mites in there. Because that's not a good idea as uh, many of the commercial beekeepers can tell you, because they did that, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And we'll talk about what happened when they did that. So we talked about why you should do it. When should you treat for mites? Well, there's a, a variety of times, and it really depends on your schedule, what you're doing with your bees, whether you're moving them, whether you're making honey, whether you're pollinating, where you are at in the world. But the basic um, times are four times typically you can use these chemicals to treat for mites. Um, you can use them anytime, but these are the common times. Um, spring before the brood production starts is one of the main ones. So you knock the mites down before anything starts going on. You get their numbers way down and then you don't have to mess with it again for the rest of the year. Um, summer. During the honey flow um, is another time that you can use. There's one of these products that you can actually use legally during the honey flow, and it doesn't hurt your honey. Um, I believe it's the only one. Uh, it's certified organic. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure, at least in the United States, I think it's the only one that you can use during a honey flow. Um, then you can do it also in the summer if you don't have a flow, because I know there's places in the south and different places where things get really hot and the flow actually stops in the, in the hot part of summer. So you could actually do it then. And then another good time is in the fall when there's brood production is um, slowing down or ceasing altogether. Um, that's another great time to treat for mites. You've got your honey off. You don't have to worry about contaminating it with some of these chemicals. And you're going to knock the mites down again before they can do more damage over the winter. Your hive will get stronger. The new bees that are born during the winter will not have mites and they'll survive more. 
So those are the four times that, you know, the professionals do um, treating for mites. Now, the other time that you should treat for mites is when you got a lot of them and they're going to kill your hive, right? So if you, you do a test and you got 50, 50 mites or 25 mites in a sample of 300 bees, you need to do something and you need to do it fast. So in that case, all the rules are just guidelines and you know if you have to save your hive take your honey off even if it's not done maybe move it to another hive that doesn't have mites treat that hive and move forward don't you know don't wait and say oh well you know the treatment says i can't have to wait till there's no brood but you know maybe there's a couple of frames it'll still work it won't be 100 percent effective but it'll still do something and so when you have that kind of mite load you can't really wait till the perfect time but i would stress don't put uh, pesticide chemicals on your hives when you have honey that you're going to sell or that you're going to eat your family you don't want to do that it's a it's not legal and b it's not safe because you could actually ingest some of those chemicals so always take that off but you can treat at different times as long as you take your honey off so if if you know if it's an emergency otherwise stick to the what the uh, manufacturers are going to suggest uh, for these products. All right, so we've handled the what and the when, or the why and the when. Let's do a little vocabulary. This is just to help us uh, talk on the same uh, under the same terms, so that we all know what we're talking about. There's a term called efficacy that all the manufacturers use for their uh, mite treatments. And they'll have it on there in their brochure, the pamphlet on their website. Somewhere they'll say, you know, this treatment is so many percent of efficacy, which means it's a fancy word for effectiveness, how effective it is at killing the varroa mite if you follow the directions to the T. And so they've done studies and tests and all kinds of things, and they'll come up with a number, let's say 73%. So this treatment is 73% an efficacy rate of 73%, which means it kills 73% of the mites if you use it perfectly. So that's just what efficacy means. Um, and it's, it's a good to know that term because they use it in all the scientific information. Now, I'm going to talk about something called control year. And that's something I just learned about yesterday. And I had put it in my presentation at the last minute because I read this uh, Professor Francis Ratnick's um, study and i put his video in here i'll send you guys a link to it a little later but i also put it in the description um, he's written papers he's from the university of sussex and it's called lasty it's the uh, laboratory of apiculture and social insects and it's a, an amazing place they do all kinds of studies and research and I'm going to give you all the information. I, I, I stress you should go there, watch their videos, read some of their stuff. It's amazing stuff. They do it, and they get funding, and then they put all the information out there for the people, the beekeepers of the world to use, and it's amazing stuff. I can't say enough great things, and I've only known about this for like 18 hours. And so that's why I'm going to use this term called control year. So what um, Professor Francis has come up with is this concept called a control year, and I haven't seen it anywhere else, so I assume it's his. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to give him credit because I haven't seen it before. But it just it's an easier way to think about how effective your mite treatment is. And I'm not going to go into explaining his whole concept because I want you to watch their video, and they do a very good job of explaining how they come up with this number. But the short answer is they talk about how quickly the mites double if you don't kill them all, and then they tell you how long your treatment is going to last. So if you have, let's say you had that efficacy rate of 73%, so you have 27% mites left, you don't really know what that means. Well, they're going to tell you what it means. They're going to tell you that you have a control year of 0.7, which means for seven months or 12 times seven, that's how long that treatment's going to last before your mite level is going to come back up to the level that it was before. So that's why it's a fantastic um, number. And I got some of their numbers from their study and put them on these products that they had listed because that way you can look at it and go, if you have a control year number of 0.4, well, you're going to have to do that thing three times to make sure that your hives are mite free. If you have one that's higher, like 0.9 or 
one or over one, then you might only have to do that one time and you're covered for the whole year. So it's a fantastic uh, concept that they've come up with. And like I said, I'll give you the video and all the information. You should watch the video. They do a great job of explaining it. And I think it's fantastic. All right, pesticide. We're going to talk about some of the treatments that are actual pesticides. For our purposes, when I'm saying a pesticide, it's a man-made chemical that uh, may or may not break down quickly and may collect in the wax. And then some of these treatments are what I consider natural compounds. So they're natural occurring elements in the world that are already there. Man didn't make them. And then usually the difference between the two is that the natural ones tend to break down faster. It's not that they're not poisonous to bees. If you put a natural compound, you know, some large amount in your bees, it still can hurt them. But typically those break down um, quicker and they don't collect in the wax as much as man-made uh, multi-chain carbon molecules that we create, which are the, typically the pesticides, um, which I'm not going to get into that whole discussion, but you know that's the difference. But for our terms, I'm going to use those two to tell you the difference. All right, I think that covers the vocabulary. If I say something later that you don't understand, ask me to explain it, and hopefully I'll know what I'm talking about. All right, so let's get into the actual treatments, and I'll talk about each one. There's five, and I'll give you as much information as I have. If you have questions, um, please ask them, and I will try to answer them. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is Thymol. It's been around for quite a while. Its uh, brand name is called Apigard, so that's the trade name. It's a little um, gel little packet of gel, which has 12.5 grams of thymol in it. And the rest of, I think it's 50 grams total. The rest of it is like a gel and uh, kind of looks like uh, those little gel packs that you use to uh, heat your food up at a party. And uh, it's uh, been around for quite a while. It was one of the early... Um, considered organic treatments because it's a natural occurring thyme. Thyme is, uh, is concentrated thyme oil from uh, that plant and it kills the mites. They don't like it. They don't like the smell of it. And so it was one of the early natural things that was used to kill the mites. So let's look at some things. Efficacy, 76%. So there's kind of what I was talking about earlier. 76% efficacy, which means it's going to kill 76% of the mites if you use it exactly the way the manufacturer suggests, which, again, you know, you need to read your instructions. They'll tell you when to use it, how to use it, where to put it, what the temperature outside should be. All of that information is important to get as close to the efficacy percentage that they're talking about. So you're going to have 24% of the mites still alive. And if we use the control year number uh, that Dr. Francis has come up with, um, 0.39, which means, you know, 0.39 years is the only amount of time that that's going to last. So, you know, less than half a year, a third of a year, 0.4. So four months, and you're going to have to do that again. So you're probably going to have to do that two or three times to get you know, the mites down, or at least two times to get the mites down to a level where your hive would overwinter um, and survive. So just know that. The cost typically is about $3.50 per packet, and they want you to use two at a time. So you're looking at $7. So you're probably going to be looking at $14 for this particular product um, to treat your hive. Um, sounds like a lot of money, but, you know, bees are $125, $130 for a package, between $180 and $250 for a nuke, depending on whether you get an overwintered one or where you get your bees from, plus shipping or, you know, gas to go get them. So they're not cheap. So $14 to save your bees is still, I would say, you know, a reasonable amount of money. Now, if you have 1,000 hives, that's $14,000, and the time to do all of this that's probably going to be prohibitive, but we're just talking about, you know, a few hives. Maybe this is a good um, product to use. 
I personally have not used this product, so I do not know. Um, I have read a lot of uh, information about it, and it sounds like a good product. But again, the efficacy, it sounds like a lot of work for, for what it is. But I'm not going to make that judgment. I'm just telling you guys what's out there because every country has different um, things that are legal and not legal. And so maybe this is the only thing that you can use in your particular area. So that's why I am talking about it. All right, the next one I'm going to talk about is Mitoway Quick Strips. And this one is also a naturally occurring compound, formic acid. It's an organic acid that breaks down quickly when you use it. Um, this particular product I have used, I used it quite a bit uh, four or five years ago. Um, I enjoyed using it. Uh, it's very strong smelling. Uh, it seemed to work quite well. Let's go over the data. Um, efficacy rate of 94.6%. So pretty high. But again, you got to use it at the right time. There's uh, some requirements for temperature. You can't use it when it's too hot. So people in the south got to be, I think, 85 degrees Fahrenheit is the top temperature. So you got to be aware that if you live somewhere like uh, Eric, we're in Alabama, it gets hot. Humid, you're in the 90s, 95. You got to be careful. You can't use this product when it's that hot because you can fry your bees. Even though it's again naturally occurring organic acid, something that is not man-made, it can still kill your bees if you put enough of it in there. I know quite a bit about this because, like I said, I used this, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, what the manufacturer suggests is two strips. You put two strips on a on a double deep hive, and uh, it's pretty effective. I think you leave it in there for seven days, seven to 10 days. And if you look at the control year number um, that the professor came up with, 0.8. So there you go. You got most of your year is covered. If you have a light mite count, you put this in, it's probably going to be good for the rest of the year. You know, do a test in the fall, make sure that you're good. If you get a one or a two, you're probably good for the winter. So that's that's why this is a good product. The other thing that's great about this product is I believe it is the only one that you can legally use when the honey supers are on in the United States. I do not know about other countries. You have to check with your local uh, apiary uh, person who's in charge of what's legal. But uh, again, you know, typically all the pesticides, they're not legal to put on when there's honey. This one the reason it's legal is because formic acid is a naturally occurring um, chemical in honey. And so what happens is you put this in the hive. And I don't know these exact numbers, but I'm going to just uh, spitball for a minute. I believe the, uh, the number is 50 parts per million that kills varomites. So you put these they're like, they're like these sponges, and you put them in there, and the, the formic acid evaporates um, and creates like a, like a uh, vapor. And then the formic acid um, density comes up to 50 parts per million, and that kills the varomites. But at 90 or 80 parts per million is when it hurts the bees. But because the bees fan... And because you use this at a temperature below 85 degrees and this material that they use that they put the formic acid in holds it a certain amount. It lets it out very, very steadily. It's very linear. And that they, it took them a long time to figure out uh, what that material is. And I think that's where the patents are involved in this product is that material whatever they're using, um, slowly releases this so that they can keep that parts per million like right around 50 or 55 and it never gets close enough to kill your bees as long as you keep it, you know, it's not hot. And the, you know, because the bees naturally ventilate and they fume it. And, you know, I put these on there and you can smell it. As soon as you put it on, the bees come up, they start roaring. As soon as you put it on, they don't like it. I'm not going to say they love it, but, you know, they start fanning and you can smell it. And then, you know, you go in there a couple of days later and you can see how much of it has evaporated out of the pads. They start shrinking. They're soft and spongy when you first put them in there. And in about 10 days, they become hard like a dried up piece of bubble gum. And then you toss them. You can actually, uh, believe it or not, put them in your compost and just compost them with the rest of your uh, natural stuff. So it's a very 
Uh, I believe it's an organic uh, product. I believe it's the only one that's also, uh, if you're an organic beekeeper and you're certified organic by the United States uh, USDA, I think it's the only one that you can use. Pretty sure. I could be wrong, but I believe it is. So in that case, it's, it's really good. Um, cost, $6 to $12. Um, why is there such a big range? Well, because you can buy them in like uh, packages of two, or you can buy them in boxes of 50, and they come in a big tub, like a little bucket, and they're sealed in there. Um, one of the problems with this product is it has a shelf life, and it will evaporate. So usually they put two pads in a little um, glassine envelope, and they seal it, so they're all in there, and they're stacked in there. And, uh, I mean, you can still use them a year or two out, but they, their effectiveness goes down. So there again, you get it into like, you know, you've, you've had something for two years. You don't want to waste it because you paid for it, but maybe it's not as effective as it was when it was brand new. It's just like, you know, prescription drugs have a expiration date on them. Same kind of thing. Well, like I said, I use this product. Uh, it worked really well for me. Uh, my hive survived. Um, there have been reports of queen loss when you use it. Again, if you use it when it's too hot, certain times you may get super seizure. So uh, if you go in your hive, you know, 14 or 18 days after using this product, and you see a lot of queen cells. They might not be swarming. They might just supersede because they didn't like it. Excuse me. Remember, they blame the queen for everything. So maybe they didn't like the smell. It was too strong. She gets blamed even though it's not her fault. So... You know, that's one of the things that they talk about. If you read all their data about the Mitoway Crip Strip, Quick Strips, they talk about sometimes queen loss, sometimes um, dead um, brood on the front of the hive. Again, if you get a, you know, maybe you put it on and all of a sudden the temperature goes up to 90 for two days and then it goes back down to 70 and you didn't know you weren't watching the weather, you know, things happen. So you might get a little bit more of the young brood killed than you would have. It's not going to hurt your hive. It's not going to destroy your hive. It's just, you know, again, that temperature and that parts per million, maybe it got a little too high in one part of the brood section. So it killed a little bit of the young brood, but it's uh, one of the only this is another great thing about this. It's one of the only ones that kills the mites inside the capped brood cells. I don't think any of the other ones do that. Most of the other um, things that we're going to talk about either kill the mites, uh, the phretic mites, which are the ones that are on the back of the bees. They either kill them by um, when the bee rubs up against one of these products and it gets on them, or um, we talk about oxalic acid, you put it in there and it fumes like formic, but it doesn't penetrate the, the cappings. It only gets the ones that are on the bees. So that's another great thing about this particular product, that it, it will kill bees inside of the brood um, pretty effectively. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good product. Um, I would definitely say that uh, it's worth uh, looking into. All right, so let's move on to one of the classic treatments. This is Apivar. This is a pesticide. I believe it's called Amitraz. I'm not a chemical engineer, so I don't know what that means, but I know that it's, uh, it's in one of the uh, categories that kills mites and a lot of the little uh, beetles and things like that in that family. Um, its efficacy is 97%. Um, and then in control years, that's 0.95. So basically, again, put it on in the spring and you're done, or put it on in the fall and you're done. Um, this is one of the um, products that a lot of commercial beekeepers use because it's quick, it's effective, and it's, uh, it's fairly inexpensive if you buy it in large quantities. Here, the cost is $3.50. But if you buy it in larger quantities, obviously it goes down. Um, one of the problems with um, this and the next one that we're going to talk about is that you have to you have to open your hive up for a lot of these. But this one, you open it up and you put these strips in and you, you separate them by two frames. And then you close it back up. But you have to go back and take those out. Um, manufacturers don't want these things in there more than like 45 days or 55 days. So you can't just leave them in there forever and uh, so that increases labor so if you have a thousand hives 
and you've got to go in there twice. You know, you can see why this is uh, one of those things that's, uh, you know, time consuming and expensive. What this manufacturer suggests for usage is one strip for five frames of bees. So typically if you're overwintering one deep, you would use two. If you're using a double deep, you use four, two in each box. I have not used this product, so I cannot tell you um, anything about that. I have heard it's very effective, and a lot of commercial beekeepers that I know do use it, and they have nothing but great things to say about it. So that's kind of all I can say about it, um, that a lot of them use it, and they think it's a great product. So again, it is a pesticide. You have to make that decision on your own. Let's go to the next one. Apistan. Another pesticide. Been around for quite a while. Probably 15, 20 years. Uh, maybe even longer. Um, efficacy 99%. 99.5, most people claim that. Control years, 1.3. So again, one time and you're done. But here's the thing. That efficacy is only if you're in an area where your varroa mites are not uh, immune to this. They have used it for so many years and such long, uh, such wide usage that there are actually varroa mites that are immune to this. And so what happens is you go in, you use this product, and you think you're going to get this 99% mite kill. You do it, you, you forget it, you never test for mites again, and then all of a sudden in the fall, your hives are starting to crash from mites, and you're like, well, I used this great product. What's going on? Well, what's happened is you used it in an area or part of the world, somewhere where the mites are actually resistant to it, and you only got like a 30% kill or a 60% kill, and so... Your control year now is more like 0.6 or 0.4. So the, the mites have had enough time to regenerate to that level where they're going to really threaten the life, of your, uh, the life of your hive. So that is one of the problems with this product is that there are parts of the world. I know Spain is one of them. They, somebody did a report, uh, a study in Spain, and the, the mites in Spain are very resistant to this doesn't hurt them at all there i think there's parts of california because of all the almond usage when they used it when they take all the bees of the almonds so you kind of have to if you use this product and it's still widely used because it's kind of like the amitraz you put it in you don't have to think about it again you take them out in 50 days and it does a great job of killing the mites um, but you should check later in the season which you should always be doing now and you should just do a random check of your hives with the little alcohol wash to say, make sure that the mites have not come back. It's a good idea to do with any of these products, but specifically this one, because they do talk a lot about uh, resistance because it's been widely used for so long. Um, a cost, $250 to $5. Again, the range is because you can buy this in the 10-pack, which is pictured there. And then that box, I think, is 100, 100 strips. So the price goes way down um, you know, when you buy them in quantity. Again, I have not used this product. It's a, it's a, you know, a heavy-duty pesticide. I tend not to use that in my hives. But if I was, you know, trying to keep 10 hives alive and they were going to die, and this was my only choice, um, I would use it. Because, you know, 10 hives times $200 is two grand, and this is going to cost you five, 50 bucks, right? 40, I think you can buy a pack of 10. So, you know, big difference between $2,550. So that's kind of, you know, the way I look at it. You have to decide, you know, how, you know, how strong of a thing you're going to put in your hive based on, you know, the economics of it. Some people would never use this no matter what, and they would just let the bees dive, and that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, and if you're just doing it for fun and you don't really want to put uh, these heavy-duty pesticides in there because they do collect in your wax, and so if you use them a lot every year, two, four strips every year, they do kind of collect in the wax, <clears throat> and they can start affecting your bees. That's why they always talk about uh, maybe you should switch your frames out every three to seven years. Because when you start using these, you know, strong chemicals that don't break down, they collect in that. And 
And that's one of the downsides of using these uh, man-made uh, chemicals that work really well. Um, you know, they have downside. There's no perfect mite treatment. Um, the next one is probably the closest, in my opinion, but it's not perfect. There's, there's problems with all of them. And again, it's all about like when you use them, how much you use them and all kinds of things. Oxalic acid is the new uh, treatment that everybody's talking about. It's actually been around for quite a while. Um, they started using it in Europe, I believe in 2006. And so they've been having great success with it. Um, so we've got an efficacy rate of 97.6. And that's if you use 2.25 grams um, vaporized. I say vaporized because that's what most people think of, but it's actually a sublimation, which is a fancy word for saying that something goes from a solid to a gas without melting. And that's really what happens to oxalic acid when you put it in the device. It actually sublimates and turns into a gas. And so you can see with the control here, you got a 1 to a 1.2. And the reason there's a range there is because the uh, the study that uh, Professor Ratnick did was done with um, hygienic bees. So they actually got a better control uh, thing with the hygienic bees. So they got the 1.2 years with the hygienic bees, and you get it like a 1 with a, with a normal bee that's not hygienic. And if you don't know what a hygienic bee is, it's one that actually will clean out dead brood when you uh, when you test it. If you take a big uh, block of brood and you freeze a, a circle of it, they consider uh, hygienic bees to, if they clean out some percentage of that, I don't know what the percentage is. A lot of them, it's probably 80 to 90 to 100%. It's pretty high because um, most bees will clean it if you give them a long enough time, they will all clean it, but hygienic bees clean it quickly. Within a few days, they recognize that those bees are dead because you froze them, and they open up the cells, they clean everything out, and they fix it. And so those are considered uh, hygienic bees, and they've been breeding those for quite a few years. Um, there's some problems with it. Um, a lot of times they don't, they're not hygienic, multi-generation. So if you have, you buy the queen, they're hygienic, but then her daughter is a little less hygienic because that gene doesn't go, it's not as strong, doesn't show itself as much in the daughters. And then you get another daughter of that one, and so it kind of dilutes the gene. So it's not an end all. It sounds great. You're like, I'm just going to go buy those bees that clean everything up. And, you know, it would be great. Um, but, and there are actually videos of those type of bees um, biting the mites, and you can see them biting them and attacking them. It's pretty cool to watch. Um, let's see, I'm getting off tangent here with the oxalic acid. It's uh, naturally occurring. It's uh, an organic compound. It breaks down very quickly. I believe this one is also naturally occurring in the, in the honey, not as much as formic acid, but it's in there. It's in a lot of plants. Oxalic acid is in spinach and a lot of things that we eat. I actually read an interesting article that um, this is one of the things that actually creates kidney stones. And I have a big problem with kidney stones. So <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. So certain things that uh, that people eat are actually have a high concentration of this. And so that could actually uh, be a problem. And one of the things that have a lot of oxalic acid is cashews. And I eat a lot of cashews. So I told my wife, hmm, that's uh, very interesting. I wonder if that's the problem. My whole family has a history of kidney stones. Um, mine is... You know, it's just kind of every three or four years, which is still pretty bad. Uh, my brother has like a gravel bottle full of them. He's had so many. So my dad just has a few like me. So, and my grandpa had a couple. So it's definitely hereditary, but maybe it's brought on by something that I'm eating too much of. Interesting that this is a naturally occurring thing that's in a lot of stuff that we eat. So the way this works is there's two theories. And I don't think either one has been proven yet, but what happens is you uh, sublimate this or vaporize it, whichever term you want to use. The correct one is sublimate, but vaporize is fine. Creates this gas inside of the hive. It's really like a dust. And so if you do this, it comes out the entrance and it, 
if you open the top, you can see it. It's like a fog. It literally fogs the whole hive, and it's a fine dust, and it settles on everything inside there. And what there's two competing theories. One says that it uh, it messes up the breathing of the mites, and they die and fall off. But another competing theory is that it doesn't have any systemic effect at all to the mite. It just gets on their pads, and they fall off. Hence, they can't hold on to the bee anymore, and they die from not being able to eat. And those are really the two theories, and I don't think either one has been proven. So the, the, the good thing about that, either theory, is that um, since it's not a systemic like the uh, amitraz or the epistan where it doesn't attack their nervous system or something like that, it's not something that typically the, the mite is ever going to be able to uh, become uh, not susceptible to. It's just not something that, you know, within a couple million years, maybe. But, you know, if it's just getting on their pads and they're falling off, how are they ever going to, you know, become resistant to it? It's not going to happen. So they still suggest that you rotate um, treatments, but I believe this one is probably one that you could use um, several times over and over and not have that problem. Um, Eric, how crucial is the dosage for oxalic acid? Rumor is a little over dosage rate can't hurt the colony. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I believe that's probably true. I don't know what that level is. I believe it's, uh, if you want to go to uh, Randy Oliver's website, uh, Scientific Beekeeping, a fantastic site. You can even donate money to Randy, and he does amazing research. He's been doing it for 15 or 20 years. He publishes these amazing papers and graphs and all kinds of scientific stuff. None of his stuff is made up. It's not anecdotal stuff. He literally, you know, keeps data and figures out stuff. And I think he has some information about um, that. And I did read a study that came, I believe, from Israel. And I think it's like twice this. So if you went to like five grams or something, you have to go way out of the range that we're using to hurt your bees. And you'll actually, I don't think you'll kill them, but you'll actually see what happens is you've put so much in there that it actually kills less mites than if you put the right amount. And that's why they don't understand. They don't understand whether that's the breathing or the pads because the two scientists that did those studies, they argue that, well, if you put more in it, it should be more effective at killing them. Why is it that if you put more, all of a sudden it doesn't kill them as effectively? So that's the problem. That's why they can't just say, well, I know it's the breathing. Because you would think if you put more of it in there and it's their breathing that it messes with, then more of them would die. But actually at some level, and I don't believe, I think it's like five grams or three or four grams. I don't remember. I read that study. At some level, the mite kill actually starts to go down. So that's a great question, Eric. And the, and the real answer is I don't exactly know, but I don't think it's anywhere near, you know, like, yes, if you went two and a half, you know, 2.2 grams is the um, one quarter teaspoon amount that most people use. So it's not something... It's not something that they can really mess up. We're not talking about a few few extra grains or something that's going to hurt your hive. So the other thing about oxalic acid, I didn't make a bunch of slides because I ran out of time because this thing was getting long enough as it is. But you can use it as a drip. So not only can you do this... Um, sublimation where you vaporize it, sublimate it, and make this gas and get this stuff all over, but you can actually use it in times when you can't do that. So, you know, let's say you had honey on there and you can't really do this because you're not really supposed to do this with honey on there, but you can make this drip and you could do that with the honey on there because it's not getting everywhere. You know, some people say yes, some people say no, but basically you mix it with a sugar syrup and you put five milliliters of it in uh, in between each frame of bees. So if you have if you have a 10 frame hive, you would use, um, what is that, 11 times 5, you'd use 55 mils. If you have two, two levels, you'd use twice that dose. I think it's up to a maximum of uh, 80. 
And again, Randy Oliver has that information on his website, scientific beekeeping about how to make that syrup, how to apply it, what, how much you mix to make the, I think it's like 30 grams. You make this uh, diluted syrup. And the interesting thing is they don't eat it. They actually, if you see them, they lick each other and they don't like it because it's bitter and they're not eating it. Well, what's happening is it's getting on the mite and it's sticking to them and then it's doing something to them and it's killing them. And the bees clean themselves, and they get it all over, and, that, and that's another way to, to use the oxalic acid. So it's kind of an interesting thing. You can use it several different ways. Um, Randy's got a great article on there about him making the solution and dipping these uh, paper towels in it and then letting them dry. And then you put the paper towels in there, and the mites get rubbed on it when the bees chew the paper towel over about six weeks, and then they die from that. So there's a lot of studies going on. There'll probably be somebody that comes out with a product like that in a, in a few years where you just don't have to vaporize it and worry about all that. You're just going to be able to put a sheet of something in there and it's going to have, you know, a 99 or 98% effectiveness uh, rate. And this particular product breaks down quickly. It doesn't, doesn't show signs of, you know, getting in the wax or anything like that, like the uh, man-made pesticides do. So in that sense... It's fantastic. And look at the cost. This is where it really shines. If you're a guy who has a lot of hives, like I have a lot, I mean, it's not, I don't have thousands, but I have, you know, almost a hundred now, um, you know, five to eight cents per hive. That's what it costs. That bag that I'm showing there is eight ounces. I believe it costs $11. Um, I think I bought a five pound bag from that Florida Scientific Laboratories place on Amazon for $44. So that's probably a lifetime supply for me. Um, as long as it doesn't uh, get too hard and I, you know, it should be fine. So I think it's a great product. One of the downsides is you have to have an apparatus. If you don't do the drip method, you have to have an apparatus to sublimate it and those can be expensive. Um, but again, if you're losing, you know, two, three, four hives every year, and they're $120, $200 a piece, I mean, how quickly you're going to pay for that apparatus? They range in price from $70 up to the professional one, which is the one I bought this year. I decided to just go for it because it saves me so much time. Um, I bought it was $490. It's a lot of money. But, you know, if it saves, all I have to do is save three packages and, you know, three hives over winter, more than I did last year, and it pays for itself in one year. And that doesn't even count the honey that those three hives are going to make next year, which, you know, could be four or $500 per hive. So to me, it was a good investment. It's a write-off. I'm just like, you know, buy it. And I think it's a good uh, thing for maybe uh, bee groups to have. If you have some kind of a bee club that has, you know, 20 or 30 members, you're talking about 20 bucks a person. Everybody puts their money in, you buy it, and everyone can use it. Um, if you have the, the professional device, you can actually treat a hive with oxalic acid in less than two minutes. So you can just go one right after the other down the row, and treat them, treat them, treat them real fast. And you can be done. I did my whole apiary in about an hour and a half. And then I was done. I have to think about it again. I knew my mite levels were going to be low. I checked them, you know, a couple months later. They were like zero or one. So it, it works really well. It's cheap. It's fairly safe. Um, when I say fairly safe, you do have to use proper equipment. I'm going to be putting up a video here in the next couple of weeks. It shows all the stuff you have to use. You should use a respirator. Um, I use a full fat face mask respirator. So there is, like I said, there's some investment in equipment. Some of those other things you don't really have to use that you might could use a, a mask um, or just not breathe it. But with this stuff, you really need to wear a respirator because if you're doing multiple hives, if the wind blows it towards you, you get it in your lungs and you can feel, you know, like a pneumonia kind of thing where your lungs, it's, it's not good to breathe. And so in that instance, you know, you have to do, again, follow directions, be safe, don't do something that's going to hurt you. But I think... In my opinion, um, the oxalic acid is probably the best treatment that we have right now uh, in the United States. Um, if you want to use this in conjunction, if you don't want to just use oxalic acid like twice a year and you're worried about it becoming, you know, bees becoming uh, resistant to it, you could switch off with maybe a formic acid, use that in the summertime. Uh, when you have honey on there and then do another oxalic acid in the fall just 
make sure you're not putting any mites into your winter hives at all. And then you can check them in the spring or do the oxalic acid in the spring. Um, one of the things that I did um, this year is I treated my packages when I first got them. And this is something that some of your package producers are now doing. They're fumigating uh, the, the packages with oxalic acid because it really doesn't hurt the bees. But it gets your mites down to almost zero so that they're not propagating mites by selling, you know, thousands. Think about all the thousands and thousands of packages. That, and I think it's four or 500,000 packages they sell in a very short amount of time across the country. And then they would just be spreading more mites. So they're starting to use this. So you should ask your package producer if you're buying packages, if they've treated them, because then you don't have to when you get them. Um, but I did it no matter what. I just decided to blanket treat them all because um, I didn't want to start with m any mites. And so I did that. And I think um, my bees are the best they've ever been this year. And they just, like I said, I tested them a couple of weeks ago. I just had almost no mites. So what I'm going to do is another treatment in about a week. I'm going to do a fall treatment um, when there's no brood. That's what I didn't talk about about this. This is not effective if you have brood. So this efficacy rate is only if you have no brood. Still kills the mites on the bees if you have brood. It just doesn't kill them inside. So what people are starting to do is if you just want to use this one silver bullet, so to speak, then you have to do, like, let's say you're going to treat in the summertime, um, you have to do two or three treatments in a row every 10 days so that you get the mites when they hatch from the cells every 10 days. And that's what some people are doing um, to get around the fact that it does not kill the mites in the brood. Um, some people are saying like five times a year, they do one in the spring, those three in the summer, and then one in the fall, and they don't have any problems um, with mites at all. They don't even worry about it anymore. It's just, that's their system, and they're not going to worry about mites. And, you know, maybe that's the solution. If you have 2,000 hives, that's what you're going to do. Um, I probably still would test just to make sure you're not overdoing it. One thing that some of the research shows that if you do the three in the summer, you can actually start to hurt the, the bees exoskeleton a little bit. And, you know, because it's three treatments, one right and the other, and it's more than they really need. But, you know, what happens is those bees, they die in the summertime within 28 to 30 days anyway. So it's not, you know, it's not that big a deal. It's not like your hive is going to crash or anything. Um, you would not want to do that in the fall because your fall bees are the ones that live, you know, all winter long. You know, they live a long time. So you would not want to subject them to like multiple treatments in a row. You just want to do one. Like I said, I'm going to do one. When the temperature is around 48 to 50. There's no more brood and the bees are in a, in a they're clustering, but they're in a loose cluster. You give them that last 2.25 grams and it gets all the mites that are on the bees. There's no mites inside the cells because there's no brood. There's nowhere for them to go. You get an almost 99 to 100% mite kill. And so if you have two or three that survive somehow, and they go through winter, you're going to have almost no mites in the spring because they aren't going to make any brood for a while. So those mites might even die. They might be on a couple of bees and those bees might die and they might, might die before you even get to spring. So that's why it's so effective when you use it this way. And um, there's uh, a, a new guy on YouTube. He's been, uh, his name is, uh, what's his name? Ian, Ian Stepler. He's a commercial beekeeper. His name is, that's Canadian Beekeepers Blog. He puts up a video almost every single day. And I think last year was his first year. I've learned so much from him, but he does oxalic acid. He has 1,500 hives, and he started doing it three years ago, and he has, like, almost zero mites now. He said that it's just really helped his apiary, like, go to the next level because he doesn't have to worry about the hives dying from mites. They still die from other things. You know, they starve. They're, there's this. There's that. Um, you know, Zima, a few of those other things, but not nearly the kill that you get from the mites. So he's gone from, you know, I don't know what his numbers were, but they were pretty high to like, you know, less than 10% loss over winter with 1,500 hives. So that's, I mean, that's impressive. So I think it, uh, 
it just shows you that if you do something to the mites, your bees are going to survive, you know, in a higher percentage. And, you know, like I said, I'm not going to try to talk people into doing it. I'm just saying what I do and I use this product and I really enjoy it. All right. What else about oxalic acid? I think that is probably all I have. For oxalic acid, if you have specific questions, I'll try to answer them. But again, there's a lot of information out there about it. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say, um, please pay attention to the efficacy of these treatments because just because you bought it and it was $10 doesn't mean it's going to kill all the mites for a full year. And that is probably the best thing that I hope people get from this video is that you need to compare them and think about the efficacy and the control year and all of that so that you're not using something that's not going to kill the mites for a full year. And then you go, Oh, well, my, my, I treat for mites and they still died. So that's, you know, that's the thing that I hope everyone learned. Always read and follow the guidelines that the manufacturers give you because they're the ones that know, you know, things are toxic in certain amounts, get it on your hands, get it in your eyes, whatever it may be. Always follow the directions, specifically the ones that tell you temperatures, where to put them in the hive, you know, what time of year to use them, because those things do affect the efficacy and it'll move all over a spectrum if you don't follow um, the rules or the guidelines that they give you. The other thing I didn't really talk about, a lot, but is it approved for the part of the world or the part of the country that you live in? Make sure that you're not doing something illegal and the bee police come and get you as you put something in your hive that you weren't supposed to. Um, I know some people do that. They don't care, but, you know, I don't want to, like, advocate doing something that's, like, totally illegal. So check your local guidelines. And if you don't understand something, ask for help. You know, find somebody that's been doing this, get online, watch some videos, get into a Facebook group, something, ask questions. There's tons of people out there. And you know the old saying, if you ask 12 beekeepers, you're gonna get 13 uh, answers, but you know, at least you'll get some information and then you can make a you can make an informed decision. Um, something like oxalic acid and the formic, there's so many people using it and so much information out there right now that I don't think you can go wrong with uh, something like that. Or the Apivar Apistran strips, those have been around for so long. Um, you know, I don't think, as long as you don't go stray off into some unknown thing that somebody's doing in their backyard that's not proven, you know, I think you'll be fine uh, with the mite treatments. Um, any questions or comments? Now is the time. Open it up to questions. Um, if you do have uh, comments and stuff later, I would love it if you would go to the video when I post it and put some comments up there so that there's going to be some more engagement um, and, and do some likes and some shares on the video because that helps uh, me get the information out to people. Because the whole point of me doing these is that I want to help new beekeepers um, you know, get a better success rate. It's, it's really sad to see when somebody buys two or three hives and they buy all that equipment and all the stuff and they put the bees in there and then they die because they didn't know about mites or they didn't know about this. You know, and it's, it's very frustrating to hear. I've actually started three beekeepers um, and none of them are continuing to do to keep bees. And that's, that's very sad. They just, you know, this is kind of a steep learning curve for those first few years. And uh, that's what I'm trying to prevent is people getting into the hobby or the business and then getting out of it. So hopefully you've got some great information. Please hit the like button. Subscribe if you have not. And I thank you for watching. Uh, anything else? I guess everybody is quiet tonight. So like I said, Thanks for watching, and until next time, uh, be extraordinary, and I will see you soon. Thank you.